Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. Mystery and Suspense Magazine has spotlighted Kira Ruta as the multi-award winning best-selling author of contemporary fiction that explores what goes on beneath the surface of seemingly perfect lives. An apt description for her specialty at just that courtesy of recent bestsellers like The Favorite Daughter and The Next Wife, which became an Amazon Best Book of the Month mystery thriller and suspense among Suspense Magazine's Best Books of 2021 and the winner of the 2022 Killer Nashville Civil Award in the Best Suspense category and moved Book Reporter to declare that this might be one of her most villainous novels yet while the Midwest Book Review complimented it as a carefully crafted domestic and psychological thriller of a novel by an author with a genuine flair for originality and the kind of narrative storytelling style that fully engages the reader's attention from the first page to last. Business Insider called it a guilty pleasure of a thriller, fast, dramatic, and satisfying, and heading back to the beginning of her noveling career with Here, Home, Hope, which won the Writer's Digest International Book Award. The world of fiction has been cheering Ruta on as her rise up the bestseller chart continued with In the Mirror, The Good by Year, which would garner similarly glowing reviews. With Red Book Magazine recognizing the family dramas and dynamics are things that we can all relate to. While the U.S. Review of Books gave all the difference two thumbs up with their quip that there are few things more entertaining than stories revealing the seamy underside of suburban life. The Library Journal in their starred review predicted that Best Day Ever would be the latest psychological thriller from Best Selling Ruta destined to fly off shelves enticing readers to write along. While Good Housekeeping would add their two cents that it's clear from the beginning that something sinister is going on in this novel, which will cost you sleep as you race through its pages. Chilling, satisfying suspense. Ruta's latest two back-to-back -back bestsellers, Somebody's Home and The Widow, have been keeping readers turning the pages as Mystery and Suspense magazine wound up their recent raise by adding that Ruta immerses us in the underbelly of Washington, D.C., Full of secrets, intrigue, corruption, and backstabbing, the widow is a whirlwind of plots and counterplots, and then you'll gasp at what has been in play all along. A wildly successful businesswoman in her pre-noveling life, she's additionally authored the non-fiction book Real You Incorporated, Eight Essentials for Women Entrepreneurs. And she's here today to talk about it all. Kira, welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us. Now, you've been successful in a lot of businesses outside of books. As a child, was your ambition to grow up to be both a writer and an entrepreneur, or one or the other? I did grow up in a house that was very books focused. My dad was a professor and my mom was an elementary school teacher. So I can't like any photo I've seen of me as a little person, there's always like a bookshelf behind me or, you know, which it just was part of life. So I, I don't remember any, you know, I, my dad would tell um, like make up stories about uh, adventures during bath times. I remember that. And uh, I can't remember the name of his uh protagonist but anyway but it was really fun and you know so I think story just was part of part of life growing up my most familiar memory is we um, my dad was a professor at Harvard and we were I uh, was in elementary school in Massachusetts and I discovered Robert McCloskey books so Make Way for Duckling and Blueberries for Sal and those were I mean my favorite books so my third grade teacher had us write to the person that we wanted to be when we grew up and so I wrote to Robert McCloskey and he actually wrote me back and he said, uh, you know, I'm an illustrator, not a, not an author, so you should research better next time. <laughs> but at least he wrote me back. So that was good. And that's probably the first memory I have of actually wanting to be an author someday. Then we moved to Ohio. My dad uh, took a position with Ohio State. And so we were in Ohio and my new librarian, Mrs. Gardier, she, I had written this book and I don't know whether it was for school or just because I wanted to, it was called Scooter and Skipper, very grippy and illustrated it to like, much like Robert McCloskey, not like that, but you know, in my style and uh, um, she laminated it and put it in the library on the shelf so people could actually check it out. That was I mean, that like that memory is so strong, too. I had a chance to be in this program where you could um, just focus on uh, writing or, you know, kind of like a self-directed in high school. And so we did a lot of um, I did a lot of reading of Emily Dickinson. I loved the poetry and so ended up writing a lot of poetry in high school. And then I in college, I studied English literature. I didn't study the creative writing stuff. I think I was still a little I somewhere along the way I got um, I don't know, I, I lost my uh, my power a bit because I didn't 
feel confident having a byline or like having a, you know, like my name attached to something. So I was mostly writing for myself. I wrote a poem um, when my two of my best friends were killed in a car accident at 16. And um, so I wrote a poem for them that was in the yearbook, that kind of stuff, but not, I mean, I wasn't showing anybody anything really publicly. So now you attended Vanderbilt University right here in our hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. Were you already set in getting your book in the publishing door as a journalist? Yeah, and just amazing professors with these, oh, yay, <laughs> Nashville, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, and and yeah, I loved Nashville and I loved like learning and, and really learning from these professors who had the, the, the like the deep South um, language and, and bringing like Walker Percy to life and uh, Faulkner and all of that. So that was very fun as well. So, but again, I wasn't writing for publication. I didn't work on the school newspaper. I didn't do any of that until after I graduated. And then I, um, that's when I got my first job, like in the publishing space, but in magazines and Dallas magazine, I moved to Dallas, all my friends from, <laughs> from Nashville, they only would go as far as Texas. I wanted to move to California. That's where my my mom and dad's roots are from and everybody's like nope we're just going to Dallas which I found to be with an unair conditioned car very hot <laughs> and bothersome so I was there I worked for Dallas magazine for a year and then I like hightailed it back to Ohio and uh, got a job at a business newspaper so that was my illustrious first byline experience. Now that journalistic path took you down some fascinating roads, both as a reporter and eventually as the story as you found success within the early 90s writing for Business First, part of the American City Business Journals, along with Columbus Monthly, Midwest Living, and for over a decade as the Connections columnist for the Columbus Dispatches this week. Your way with words then landed you a gig writing in the corporate world as an account executive for Falgren and Swink working your way up to VP of Stanley Steamer Marketing by the mid-1990s before fully flexing your entrepreneurial wings and founding Real Living, a female-focused real estate chain that expanded to 22 states before it was eventually acquired by Berkshire Hathaway. Along the way, Entrepreneur Magazine would list you in their 50 fastest-growing women-led businesses, and you received multiple awards, including the Stevie Award for Women in Business. And within the advertising realm, your writing on campaigns brought home Addy Webby Television Communicator, Prism, and Web Awards, all culminating in the writing and release of your first published book, notably in the nonfiction realm. Please talk about how this truly impressive resume culminated in the writing of Real You Incorporated, Eight Essentials for Women Entrepreneurs. It was funny because I did always want to be an author, but I also always wanted to be Darren Stevens on Bewitched. <laughs> which is weird. I didn't want to be like the magical person. I wanted to be in advertising. So I love that. My dad was a marketing professor. So I think that's where I get that part of my brain. So I really, I was working for newspapers and, you know, obviously writing that type, but I always wanted to try my hand in advertising. So I got a job in an ad agency and um, kind of parlayed that into um, going in-house for my client, which was Stanley Steamer. And you do, you write a lot. And I found myself at the ad agencies with all these different clients, you know, writing TV spots, radio spots, you know, all different kinds of writing, which I think it, it, it does grow your muscle, but you still have to sit down and write that novel, right? So I would, I would, you know, I have several in the drawer novels that, you know, I at various times tried to get published but then, you know, had four kids and, uh, you know, <laughs> like other stuff. So I, uh, yeah, so I kept working. I worked at Stanley Steamer until um, I had to file a class action lawsuit against them for sexual harassment and gender discrimination. So that was fun. So then I was out of work from there and uh, my husband had done a roll up of 14 real estate companies in Ohio and needed a brand. And that's kind of what I was doing, branding and marketing. So much like how I helped Stanley Steamer realize that 90% of their customer base were women and that they were talking to people the wrong way and trying to shake customers. It was yeah, turning the paradigm to make, make people understand in, in most every industry, the women consumer is the dominant one. So same thing in real estate. It's a, a residential real estate, especially dominated by um, one of the first careers where you could make, women could make as much as 
men. There's no glass ceiling, um, you know, and they're all entrepreneurs. And what we needed to do as a broker was market to the right consumer. And when I started Real Living, you would see um, all the big brands having two white men shaking hands in front of a, you know, yard sign. I'm like, no, no, no. Women make up 92% of your customer base. They do make all the decisions and we're going to talk to her. And I remember like it, some of the first speeches and talking to the companies and trying to explain this. They're like, who's her? She, what she, you know, because people just weren't used to talking about women as a consumer. So anyway, so that was a fun experience mostly. And we did, we get to, we grew it to 22 states. And then the um, real estate crash happened. So, so then that's when we sold. Yeah, I was actually asked by the American Marketing Association to write a paper about kind of branding and marketing and, and my thoughts about it. So I, I put together this whole outline and then I started realizing, wow, this might be a book actually. And so this is, you know, and this never happens. So on, and I didn't really know you're not supposed to do it this way, but on the same day I sent the um, kind of the pitch document, whatever you call it, the outline. And I don't even know if I had a sample chapter at that point. And then um, two Wiley publishers and then to an agent in Boston who I'd heard of. And they both responded the next day, luckily the agent first. And, and apparently that never happens. And, and she's like, what? They've reached out to you. Okay, let me handle it. And so she she handled the deal and um, it happened really quickly. And so all of a sudden I was writing a book and, you know, the fun part about that was I did get to kind of mush together my background. You know, what I always wanted to do was write a book. And then uh, I love marketing as well and kind of helping articulate the process that I was teaching people across countries, particularly women, how to put their personal brand into their business brand and, and make it unique. And so that was fun, except for the fact that I didn't know once you write a business book, you have to go on a speaking tour. And I'm like, no, I wrote everything I know in, in said book. And that, um, so that led to getting a speech coach and learning a new skill because I was terrified, but found myself in front of thousands of women across the country. And, you know, um, telling them about living your life, life of your dreams and starting side hustles when you have time to and, and, and all that kind of thing. And I remember I was in Austin at this women's expo and I was finishing up my speech and this woman in the front row raised her hand. She's like, so have, are you doing your life of your dreams? And I'm like, ah. she's like, what's your dream? I said, oh, you know, to publish a novel and uh, I better get going on that. <laughs> so that kind of um, made me realize that it was time to go for it again, like really focus on that dream that I'd kind of pushed a little bit to the side. With the success of that first published book, you next endeavored out into the fiction realm for the first time with Here Home Hope, which would go on to win a Writer's Digest International Book Award. Was that transition when you found to be an easy one? This was starting fresh with the new idea because my agent at the time wanted me to kind of mirror the advice that I had in my nonfiction book. So um, it, the story deals with a woman going through a midlife crisis and she makes a list of things she'd like to change in her life. And they're very closely aligned with the nonfiction messaging. So that's that's where that came from. I write about the suburbs. I am a creature of the suburbs. That's just what I know. And the best thing about Here Home Hope, I remember, was my first book tour. And I, we were moving to California at the time, or we'd moved to California, but we had to bring another car from Ohio. And so I stopped in like, multiple stops and multiple states along the way and did book signings and all that. And almost every, every place is like, did you used to live here? Because the suburbs are really pretty much the same everywhere. So every, every suburb has a Kelly and all those characters, I think running around. So that was kind of a rewarding uh, insight, I guess, when Here Home Hope came out. I mean, people say that these characters are familiar and they should be familiar because they're amalgamations of experiences and life and all that stuff. But I'll never forget my Here Home Hope um, when I went back to Columbus for a book tour. I was at some event and this woman like crosses her arms and then turns around and stomps away. I'm like, Holy camoli, what was that? And this, my friend says, Oh, she thinks she's one of the characters in the book. And I'm like, I don't even know her name. Why would she think? Yeah. So that that's the only time I've had like that kind of visceral reaction. Was it more thrilling to now see your name on the cover of your first fiction novel? 
so fun. And yeah, just, you know, it's one of those things, those moments in life where you just, you, you try to hold on to them because that, you know, like, I mean, we're, you know, I'm, I love life. (laughs) Life is great for me right now. And I'm so, I feel so blessed, but those, those moments, those, uh, those, the memories of achieving like a dream, those, I don't know, those are just make life so much more real and special. So yeah, I, I'll never forget having the book launch party. We were living in Malibu at the time and my friend had it at her um, retail store and room at the beach. And it was, it was just a beautiful space. And then and there wasn't a bookstore in Malibu at the time. And all these people came and I, I mean, I just, it's, I can still just picture the book saying, like signing the, my name on it. Yeah, it was great. Did that make all the difference heading into the writing of your next fiction work at the same title? It was pretty much my first darker, like suspense filled book. And unbeknownst to me, I mean, I really, that's kind of, every book started getting a little bit darker and darker and darker. I'm not sure why, but that's just the way it it went. But um, yeah, so all the difference. And that one, the fun part about that one is I have a character in there who's a restaurant reviewer and he's based on like this, um, amazing man named Doral Chenoweth, who was the grumpy gourmet and restaurant reviewer for the Columbus Dispatch for a gazillion years. And I always worked in restaurants like through college and like when I need, whenever I needed money, like Houston's and Nashville during college and on Music Row, <laughs> I worked at a couple of the places there. And um, then in Columbus, I worked at a place called Lindy's and Doral would come in and he, whoever he decided he wanted to talk to and have Mrs. Jenna with du jour, you'd have to sit down and um, help him taste things. And, and, do, and anyway, he became like a second dad and just a great guy. So he's the character in the, in all the difference. So that, that one's special because of him. If you know you may die soon, what choices would you make? Did you come up with this tagline before diving into the writing of In the Mirror? Where Kirkus Reviews complimented the way you wrote with a fluent, psychologically subtle realism that cuts Jennifer's pathos and occasional self-pity with humor and irony an absorbing story of a woman grasping at life in the midst of death. While Forward added their compliment with the way you succeeded in balancing sadness and humor, the retrospective tone of this novel is both therapeutic and affecting. Was this story one that had a little bit of real life inspiration you were pulling from? And did its characters come to you first? Usually for me, it's a title and then in a character. It's strange, they kind of pop up about the same time. So with Jennifer, Um, she was loosely based on my friend, uh, Stephanie Spielman, who, um, had like her husband was a football player and she lived really close to us in um, the suburbs and, you know, just, I mean, just resilience and determination and this fighting spirit that she had, um, after her breast cancer diagnosis and she's helped so many people and, you know, anyway, but, um, that story and just, I think just thinking about you're in the prime of life, this young mom that you meet and in the mirrors, it's just, you should not have to worry about all of that. So how do you take that and and how do you make it also, I guess, hopeful as as much as possible and wrap a story around it. So that's, that's where that came from. What inspired you to want to head next into back-to-back beach series? First with Indigo Island, which featured Weekend with the Tycoon, her forbidden love, the Trouble with Christmas and the Billionaire's Bid, and then the Laguna Beach series with Laguna Nights, Laguna Heights, Laguna Lights, Laguna Sights, and One Night in Tahoe. Indigo Island, so we lived in Malibu two years, and then the company my husband was running, Consolidated Operations in Irvine, so now we are in Laguna Beach, (laughs) so I'm now in the OC, but Indigo Island is based on when we used to drive from Ohio to Defusky Island. Well, you couldn't drive to Defusky Island. You got on a ferry at Hilton Head and then went to Defusky Island and uh, this magical place with like all this Gullah tradition. And I, I had written a book called what was it called? Lines in the Sand, I think, that was set there and with with kind of the Gullah stuff and everything. But I didn't really ever publish that one. So what I wanted to do was set another series in. Uh, Defusky Island, but I called it Indigo Island. And my friend <laughs> who I met down here in Orange County, Jane Porter, she is a huge um, romance writer and also started her own imprint 
called Thule. And so she said, have you ever considered writing romance? And I'm like, no, I haven't. I don't think I could do that because I don't think I could do the sex scene part, you know? And she goes, oh, you don't have to, you can make it, you know, just like have them kiss and then close the door. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll try that. So that's where this whole idea came from. And it was so fun because for two years I was in the romance world and I actually was asked to speak at RWA, Romance Writers of America Conference in New York about branding, which was su super fun because then it went kind of circular back to really incorporate it again. And I kind of put together uh, some tips on branding for authors and it's actually available on my website now for a free download if anybody's interested. But so my, my two years in uh, romance taught me a lot. I didn't know that there were tropes and like rules to follow and that, you know, there were, cause I had never really been a rule <laughs> follower in my writing. So that, you know, I just think any kind of writing helps your writing get better. So I did that, but I did discover that I'm not really good at romance because I just turned red talking about it. I just, <laughs> just I'm, I'm, maybe I'm just darker than that or something. But then, so after my two, uh, my two series in romance, I had a Laguna Beach series and the Indigo Island series. I went back to uh, kind of darker women's fiction. I really like Trouble with the Trouble with Christmas. Yeah, that one was really fun to write. And um, at the Laguna Beach one, this is a funny story. So my I going to this ha a hair place around the corner from me and this woman, Ashley, is doing my hair. And I guess it just opened. So I just met her and uh, met her. The next chair down is she, her friend. She's like, oh, my God, look at look at all these pictures. You're in us or, you know, you, one of the tabloid things or, or people or something. I'm like, why are you in People Magazine? She's like, oh, well, I, I just got married. We're, you know, I married a guy that was in um, the OC series, right? So, <laughs> so then she says to me, well, you, you should write a series based on what people that were in a reality series are doing now, because that's kind of her, what her life was like. So that's, she was kind of the inspiration for that. So that's where the Laguna Beach series came from. What drew you back into the suspense realm from there with the writing of The Goodbye Year? So I was all in romance. And then I I, I felt like, I guess I, <laughs> I felt a pull to go back to more, I guess. And, and I wouldn't have called it suspense back then with The Goodbye Year. I was just thinking back to women's fiction. So um, that story came about and uh, it, you know, it was a little, getting a little bit darker. And I remember I was... <laughs> at lunch with another author and I was telling her the plot of the goodbye year and she spit her coffee at me. She's like, you can't write dark. I'm like, oh, oh, I think I can actually. And she's like, no, you're too cheerful. I'm like, eh, we'll, we'll see about that. So anyway, so then uh, the goodbye year came out and uh, my agent at the time, she says, why don't you write a women's fiction series about, you know, elementary school parents? I'm like big little lies kind of idea. And I, I said, oh, all right. That didn't really sound that fun to me but I sent her an outline I was waiting for her to um you know respond or give me notes and Paul from best day ever popped in my head good housekeeping told readers from the beginning that there's something sinister going on in this novel promising it will cost you sleep as you race through its pages resulting in chilling satisfying suspense when did Paul and Mia Strom first drive into your imagination in the fascinating way that followed in best day ever so I just sat down and wrote him and he was so vivid and, and I'm a pantser. I write for the scene of my pants. I don't plot. So I didn't really know where he was going to take me, but it was a very strong, I think I wrote the first draft in like a month or two. I mean, it came out really fast and um, anyway. And so then I sent, uh, I sent it to my beta reader and she's like, oh my gosh, this is your best book yet. You've got it tell your agent about it so I tell I send it to Katie and she goes oh I, I don't read those kinds of books <laughs> I'm like oh no you have to I think this is really good and so then my beta reader friend she's like well tell her you're gonna have to move on if she doesn't want to read it so I, I email Katie back I'm like can you please just give it a try you might like it and the next morning I wake up she's in New York and I'm out here and uh she's sent like five emails I love it call me we're gonna sell this <laughs> you know so that was really fun what does it look like when you're telling stories through all these different points of views? Say Paul, for example, here. He, um, Paul, or really whenever I'm writing a character and I, I'm pretty much, I love first person narration. So he, I am him in a way. So I don't really see his face. I see when I'm writing, I kind of, it's almost like a movie, but you're in it and you're writing it. It's kind of strange, but yeah, that's kind of how it works in my brain. 
he just kind of started acting the way he acts. And then because he's such a dominant <laughs> narcissistic character, he, you know, he just kind of took control. And, uh, and I didn't really know until I went on book tour for, for that story for best day ever, where he came from. People, my daughter's like, where did this guy come from? And I'm like, I don't know. And then I started realizing it's all my spectacularly bad male bosses I had through my career, you know, and they were all still in there like Myron and Wes and Jay. And then these people, I mean, they were still in there and like all these awful things they would say and the way they would treat women, it was still there. And it is really kind of cathartic actually. What do you feel is key for the aspiring author well, then really nailing writing a narcissist like this one? Right. It's, I mean, I think for me, um, you know, just knowing that, I mean, estimates are like 10 to 15% of the population um, has some type of narcissism going. And so you probably do know somebody that's like this um, to maybe a lesser degree than what we would put in, <laughs> in a novel, but hopefully. But I, I think the, the key to me about about these creatures is that it's just all about them. And so that's um, how they go through life and how they look at things. And, and people are more collectibles than loving relationships. So it's it's really just about power, control, and me, me, me. So that's, that's kind of how I see them. And that's how they show up when they're yeah. ready to take over a novel. The Washington Post trumpeted the favorite daughter as a Gone Girl style domestic suspense novel that follows Jane, a narcissistic perfectionist, dealing with the death of her daughter and meets some colorful characters along the way. Who were any of your favorite to create here? Favorite daughter, I have Dr. Rosenthal, who is her um, psychiatrist, Jane's um, therapist that she speaks with. And actually one of my best friends in Malibu is Laura Rosenthal, who is, is a therapist. It's like, what, you know, she's very smart. So she actually helped me understand narcissists way back when, when I first met her, I was explaining to her this encounter I'd had and, and she's like, well, that's a classic narcissist. So anyway, she really helped me see these people more clearly. And I happened to be drawn to writing about them. So anyway, so in the book, Jane uh, believes that she's kind of using her therapist as a, a cover. She's painting a story to her therapist that her therapist could maybe be on her side for one of some of her um, mischievous things she's up to so that's one and then I really like the uh, Lyft driver Sam he's he's a great character in the book because Jane has decided that she cannot drive she's just too nervous to drive after her, the death of her daughter and so she um, she likes to be driven anyway <laughs> she likes to be pampered so she's kind of latched onto this uh, Uber Lyft driver guy named Sam so and he ends up being a a more important role in the story than maybe you think at the beginning. And, and I also like uh, the younger daughter, Betsy. She, she was a really fun character too. Sometimes hard to have a novel all through one narration, first person narration. Paul, like I said, his story came out very fast and it was just, it was set so easy to write. And, and you know, like some novels are fast some novels are slow some novels are like ah, painstaking Jane was tougher because I think there's a lot of from the editorial standpoint and they always make it better but um people were worried about like the notion of a good mother it's it's hard to write a story about maybe not such a great mom and get it the tone right and and so it she took more work I would say than Paul did but it, you know so I find, I, I do find if you have a good, strong first person narrator that you can stick with, it does make the story really compelling because you only have that perspective, right? So you don't know what all these other characters are thinking and, but it kind of, it's tough. So then I'm, I like having maybe a, a cast of characters like the goodbye year or, a, a, you know, somebody's home where, where you have a lot of people taking over the story. So if you get stuck with some Buddy's perspective, or if that person's going to give too much away in the story, then you can cut to the next person. The Next Wife was a runaway hit with characters and readers alike, becoming an Amazon Best Book of the Month mystery thriller or suspense, and among Suspense Magazine's Best Books of 2021, inspiring book reporter to predict that this might be one of your most villainous novels yet. 
and taking home the 2022 Killer Nashville Silver Award for Best Suspense Category. And the legendary Midwest Book Review celebrated this recent hit as a carefully, as a carefully crafted domestic and psychological thriller of a novel by an author with a genuine flair for originality and the kind of narrative storytelling style that fully engages the reader's attention from page one to the last and will prove to be an immediate and enduringly welcome addition, welcome addition to community library collections. You featured a specific signature within your writing here that worked especially well against the office setting and ratcheting the tensions up. Please talk about a specific signature you featured within your writing here that really effectively works to ratchet the tension up, especially in an office setting like this one. I like to compress time too when I write. So I like to, you know, make things like best day ever was a day and the favorite daughter was a weekend, I think. And, you know, just squishing things together. So squishing people together in a setting also kind of ups the stakes. So this one was fun because it was my first kind of office setting uh, for my books. And it was based loosely on when my husband and I ran the company in Ohio together and his office was in one side of the building and my office is in the other. And so I, that's kind of where it started. And I think the title at the time was The Second Wife, but the same idea. And so I just sort of imagined um, a uh, War of the Roses office style featuring um, the first wife, the second wife, and then the guy in the middle. And they're all working in the same office. So I thought that would be a fun premise. I, mean, I still stuck them living in the suburbs, but it was fun for them to be able to, you know, get out of the suburbs and go downtown and, and have, I guess, you know, for me, it's just, making making the office setting kind of um uh i don't know like claustrophobic in a sense so that you've got them all in a sense trapped in the same the same floor in the same four walls with all the other employees just watching this whole situation unfolding so that that i, I guess it gave it more of a sense of urgency. You structured time again around what Business Insider described as a fast, dramatic, and satisfying pace in somebody's home, which they concluded was a guilty pleasure of a thriller. What can fans look forward to once they get sucked into the story with Julie and Jess Jones? Somebody's home, um, my husband uh, was elected to Congress for um, a term. <laughs> so all of a sudden I found myself in DC, which was really awesome. And um, this story started, I went to some hearings about the rise of domestic terrorism in our country and globally, and all the foremost experts he was um, running, I think it was his committee was doing the hearings and so anyway I just learned too much to get it out of my head then when during lockdown yeah the guy Tom the main character popped into my head as kind of being maybe one of those people that's been influenced by stuff he's seen online and he's kind of gone down the dark rabbit hole and he's you know working he's kind of like stuck he's working at a bar he doesn't have you know, he didn't go to college. He's just kind of trapped. And so these people find him and have, have already begun influencing him by the time we meet him on the page. So I felt like that he kind of started the story. And then um, I also have a, a Orange County mom and daughter, and she's, you know, married this filthy rich guy, but their marriage is pretty loveless. And he, you know, uh, she decides it's time to leave. And so she ends up buying a house across town, her first home that she's ever owned. And unfortunately, Tom ends up being in the guest cottage behind and uh, he has decided he won't leave. So that's kind of where we have the weekend <laughs> story come together. You came out with back-to-back -back bestsellers when The Widow next hit store shelves in 2022, with the Library Journal hailing it as a deliciously diabolical take on marriage, politics, and the lies that bind. And I imagine with your husband being elected to Congress, you had plenty of political insider source material to draw from within its writing. I think everything you learn about and experience becomes part of your novel writing um, arsenal, I guess. And I have to know a setting pretty well to be able to put a story there. And so, you know, having the chance to spend a couple of years in DC really helped. And really the place is just so fascinating and historic and beautiful and backstabbing that there's just a no end to uh, what I'd like to do there. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would like to use DC as a setting again. And I we try to say stay not too political. I mean, in this book, in the widow, you know, both sides behave badly. So it's not it's not any anything political to speak of like that. I, I, you know, it's so it's lightly political, more about the suspense and the story than it is about 
um, the actual experiences. The Widow is my first one set in DC and it's a political thriller, I guess it's called. And it's about power couple, Jody and Martin Asher. He's a congressman and she's like at the top of the DC social circles. When you meet them though, things aren't going so well in the marriage. Martin is uh, having an affair with the staffer, Jody believes. And that is a legacy killer. So that is not something that she's going to put up with. And it's so hard with all these books to say too much without giving it all away. But I don't know if you saw the New York Post article that came out this weekend. <laughs> no. Okay. So, oh my gosh, I should, where's, I don't know. Do I have it? The headline is my favorite part. Let me see if I can find it. It's um, so one of our friends, when, when my husband was in Congress, they were visiting out here. He's running again, actually, Max Rose. And uh, he, he's like, so what's your next book about? And I said, oh, I've got a cheating congressman <laughs> who uh, his wife is you know, fed up with or uh, something like that. And he's like, oh, my God, that's a great story. I'm, I'm shipping off the post. I'm like, oh, no. The headline is ex-rep Harley Ruda's wife, Kara, writes novel about cheating congressman killed by wife. And they kept going, so was this based on a true story? I'm like, no, no. I mean, it's based on being in DC, but it's not based on him. And then they interviewed my husband too. And he's like, no, I didn't have enough. It was just crazy. So yeah. And right. then the the print version, my friend just brought me a copy of the print version this morning because she was happened to be in New York. And that headline's funny too. <laughs> you see if I get it. Um, it's in quotes, novel way to kill Paul politician. It's only right, W-R-I-T, dear. <laughs> it's just goofy. We understand you're also working on a new series. I just got my second round of edits back for it. Wish me well, but it is called um, Beneath the Surface. And it's a little succession <laughs> meets the OC-ish. And it's set on a weekend yacht trip to Catalina, which was fun. So I hadn't done like, I hadn't taken my, my cast of characters, so to speak, on a trip yet. So at least I got to go on a little journey on this one. And uh, so it's it's fun. And it's, it's going to be um, two books about these characters. So that'll be different for me, much like what I did back on the romance series, right? So I stick with the family and kind of get to look at them for a couple of books. So it'll, it'll be fun and it's going to be kind of different for me. Uh, the family are the Kingsleys, you know, as, as you would be when you're a rich real estate tycoon type guy. Yeah. So much like the Murdochs and the New York Post and much like, you know, that kind of family uh, dynamic. So I've been having fun with that too. It was actually based on my, one of my friends bid on a yacht boat trip, whatever, at a charity auction, and they invited us to go on it. So we got to be on this big, massive boat going over there. It was fun. Finally, before we go, having found such success writing in it, are you looking to stay in this lane or move into another new subgenre of fiction with your next creative turn on the road? My next book that comes out next year is more of, I think it's going to go back to the darker women's fiction, but with suspense in it too. So it has um, a bigger cast of characters and it's, uh, you know, I guess it's like stepping a little bit side from just directly husband and wives, uh, which is what I've been doing to, to a bigger cast. And actually somebody's home was that way as well. I love to write and it, you know, at this point in my life, I have the time to do it. And so, yeah, as I, I do have a historical fiction, but it, um, I need to revise it and put in some more details and all that kind of stuff. It was actually set in the Dust Bowl because my grandmother from Texas, that was one of the foundational moments of her life. And she would talk about it and you could taste the sand in her mouth when she was talking about it and just sand everywhere. Anyway, it was based on her experience, but then um, that huge author just published The Four Winds. <laughs> so my, my editors like, or my agents like, you know, you're going to have to just let that go for a while. That is the Dust Bowl uh, novel now. Okay. So my grandma's story is back in the shelf. But yeah, to your point, I, you know, I do, I love to write and it's, it's fun to go in different directions. I do, I still love the husband and wife um, domestic suspense area. And I have a couple more of those, but my, my agent's like, just slow down. I'm like, no, I can't slow down. I want to, I want to tell stories. So I, uh, once I finish this next round of edits, hopefully to their satisfaction, I will probably dive into another book because it's so fun. That's my favorite part. The blank page 
and just a character coming to life. Ugh, so fun. Kira, it's been wonderful talking today. Thank you so much for taking our time to be on About the Authors TV.